at 11, we hear from a family member of one of the victims of the 2018 Schoharie limousine crash reacting to the new Inspector General report. Early voting begins across the state. Emma Quinn reports on some of the controversy around absentee ballots and how the gubernatorial candidates spent their Saturday. All that and more tonight on CBS 6 News at 11. CBS 6 News starts now. Good evening, everybody. I am Tom Eschen. The families of the victims of the 2018 Schoharie limousine tragedy are reacting tonight to a newly released report by State Inspector General Lucy Lang. This evening, we take a thorough look at what the office found in here. The families of the victims of the Schoharie limousine crash have been waiting for years for answers. Reports have come out one by one on what went wrong to lead to that tragic day in 2018. And after some delay, the inspector general released its report on Friday. 29 pages of what they found. They began by saying they found no evidence of misconduct or malfeasance on the part of any DOT or DMV employee, but rather significant gaps in policies, procedures, and intra-agency communications that prevented prestige misconduct from being efficiently identified and addressed. But later in the report, following examples of missed opportunities, the report takes a different tone. The inspector general determined that these incongruous actions were a result of both DOT's long-standing practice of attempting to gain compliance through civil penalties and its failure to require that all open violations be resolved before a reduced civil fine is offered and paid to lift a suspension. The report states that in February 2018, following the DMV's order of suspension against Prestige, the DOT proposed to reduce the fine from $5,000 to $500 in exchange for a guilty plea. Prestige agreed the suspension was lifted despite the vehicle not being in compliance. It happened again in September 2018, one month before the tragedy. The families of the victims have been active in their fight for justice. Tonight, Kevin Cushing, the father of victim Pat Cushing, telling CBS 6... It's heartbreaking to read about the number of lost opportunities that should have taken that vehicle off the road and permanently out of service. It appears the DOT and DMV were much more focused on assisting the Hussein family and keeping their dangerous and illegal vehicle in service rather than protecting the occupants of that limousine. The DOT responded to the report agreeing with the recommendations but saying... The department disagrees with the conclusion that it could have unilaterally initiated a process that would have resulted in the immediate seizure of the Schoharie limousine crash vehicle plates. It does not explain that it would have required multiple agencies under separate legal authority to proceed with registration suspension followed by plate revocation and coordination with police, the latter two of which were not under the jurisdiction of the department. You can read more on CBS6Albany.com, but now we get to the weather on this fine evening. Taking a look over Glens Falls, a dark night, so there's a little bit of a crescent moon here as you bring in now Craig Adams. Thank you, Tom. It was a pretty good day, certainly a chilly start, and then it turned out to be pretty comfortable during the afternoon. We're back to those chilly readings right now with a lot of the outlying areas in the 30s, including Saratoga Springs and Glens Falls still holding at 40 degrees at the Albany Airport. You were mentioning the crescent moon. Here's the view tonight of it. Pretty easy to see, too, with the skies pretty clear. Thanks to Michelle Quinn for that view from Post and Kill. And you can see on the satellite time lapse here, we're pretty clear. I think we're setting ourselves up for another pretty sunny day tomorrow. It will be staying rather clear through the night, 28 to 33 for the temperature range. All right, even though the fall color has kind of went past the peak here in the local area, down in southern parts of the Hudson Valley, it's really looking good. So we're going to show you some great pictures of the fall color a little bit further south from here coming up in a few minutes. Tom? Thank you, Craig. Today, the start of early voting in New York State for the November general elections. Early voting goes from now until November 6th. CBS 6's Emma Quinn caught up with voters as they head to the polls this weekend. Capital Region voters were able to hit the polls as early voting polling sites opened Saturday morning. I took advantage for, uh, of early voting because my schedule wasn't conducive to vote on November 8th. Um, I love the accessibility of early voting. I think it's the way to go. Early voting polling sites began in New York State in 2019 and have grown over the years. People should take advantage of early voting. I think it's the way to go. Uh, I think we probably need to expand access to it, honestly. Um, it's a great way to sort of advance the democratic, democratic exercise of voting. Um, why not be able to do it several days in advance of the election? But getting all the votes counted could come with some headaches. 
According to the Associated Press, there have been over 100 lawsuits filed nationwide for the November 8th elections. Just this September, Rensselaer County Republican Commissioner Jason Schofield was indicted on charges by the FBI for unlawfully using voters' names and birth dates in connection with absentee ballot applications he submitted to a New York State Board of Elections website in 2021. CBS 6 asked the commissioner about keeping voters' ballots safe this election season. Protocol or anything the state put in place as far as just making sure there's safety voting? Just uh, the, everything that we've always had. There's nothing new this year. Um, our inspectors are doing a great job keeping the lines moving thoroughly. Earlier this week, Republican election officials around the state were reluctant to count absentee ballots that adhered to new early ballot counting laws, but started scanning and counting votes after a warning from the state attorney general, Letitia James. Kathy Hochul signed that absentee ballot law in January. She was in her hometown of Buffalo, where she cast a ballot on Saturday. That's what we do. We work together, we team up, and we get results for the people of the state of New York. That's the message we're taking all across the state. Meanwhile, downstate, her Republican opponent, Congressman Lee Zeldin, spoke at a rally in Queens. We want our district attorneys to prosecute and enforce the law. And we unapologetically back our men and women in blue. In the Capital Region, Emma Quinn, CBS 6 News. Tonight, we want to introduce you to Kaylee Palm, a 14-year-old Avril Park native who recently was diagnosed with childhood brain cancer. But her incredible attitude, certainly an inspiration for us all and an inspiration for the 100-plus people who turned out today for a golf outing at Burden Lake to raise money for her treatments and travel, all the greens fees, cart fees, going to her family. She went to the hospital in August with neck pain. They found a tumor had emergency surgery to remove it 24 hours later. She just finished a month of radiation in New York City. She was still smiling today. I'm so thankful for everybody to come here and just be here and see me and everything. And it's just, it's so, it's crazy. It's just crazy that we know this many people and that it's just that they know me and they know my stories. We wanted to help out. Uh, we do a lot of golf outings. This one hit home. She's 14, my daughter's 12. So I definitely wanted to kick in. She'll start chemo in December. They plan on a kickball fundraiser next week if you want to check that out. The Foothill Arts Council hosted an appraisal fair today at Proctor's Theater. Many people flocked to this event for the opportunity to find out if their everyday objects could be worth a fortune. All kinds of odd things boss packed those doors today. Someone brought in a sword, a stamp collection, where we had that. Uh, is this a wire? You never know what you're going to get here. And uh, sports memorabilia. So uh, it covers a wide variety, and sometimes they have something I don't know who to take the person to because uh, it's, it's kind of unusual, So, but we find somebody. Tobin Cash, that gentleman's name, perfect name for this event, says he hopes the Foothill Arts Council will be able to host this event next year for those who didn't get a chance to participate this time around. All right, we'll be right back, but first... Retiring comfortably, it sounds good, but what's it going to take? Coming up, how much money Americans say they need to retire, according to a new survey. Americans want to retire. The question is, can they? D.D. Gatan has more on the new numbers shedding light on how prepared people are for retirement. Market volatility, inflation, and an overall shaky economy. It's caused many to think they need more than a million dollars for retirement. This is a time of your life that you should be looking forward to and not having those kind of anxieties. A Northwestern Mutual survey found Americans now think they need at least $1.25 million to retire comfortably a 20% jump from last year. A simple trip to the grocery store, giving anxiety to some people hoping to retire. Every day when I go to the grocery store and see that things have gone up within hours, certainly before the, the day before, uh, it does kind of cause uh, you to wonder, will I make it? you know, even now before retirement. Data shows Americans' average retirement savings dropped 11% from last year as inflation surges. What we're saying is that a lot of people are delaying their retirement or they're going back to work part-time to make ends meet. But even those who have saved are having doubts. 
I'm just hoping now that what I thought would be sufficient will be in light of the economy. Experts say something else you could look into in addition to a 401k or a high yield savings account is a reverse mortgage for older homeowners. In certain cases, it could be a reliable source of income. Reporting for the National Desk, I'm Dee Dee Gatton. All right, Craig Adams here with us at the desk. And Craig, we've had some really nice weather, feels like, lately. The temperatures have been nice, the sun's been out, it's been great. We had one day earlier this week, I believe it was on Wednesday, where the temperatures shot up into the upper it, 70s. I was hot that day, I'll tell you that right now. Nice I had, I had a jacket, I was like, didn't need it. Nice feeling to the air. You know, we have the opportunity for more mild days ahead this week, although maybe not quite to the level that we had earlier this week. 63 today, that was above the normal high, which should be 56 degrees, so... All in all, a pretty good day with bright skies area-wide about the area. Should have a repeat performance tomorrow. Look how chilly, though, it started off this morning. 29 in Albany. That's the chilliest we've been so far this fall. Glens Falls was down to 23. Bennington, 25. Pittsfield was 27 degrees. All right, on our Fryhofer Skycam right now, 41 in Schenectady. As we check out the view from our downtown Albany Empire Plaza location 45 degrees there and from Troy we've got 41 one more stop taking us into Pittsfield where the temperature is 37 degrees all right let me show you some pretty fall scenery from uh, further south in the Hudson Valley Laurie Santulli sending this uh, nice picture in here from Rockland County up at Tallman State Park Look at that beautiful walkway there, all nicely shrouded with those orange leaves. All right, let's take a look at another view. This one uh, down from looking from Route 9W, the overpass, over to the three bridges here. Here's the Bear Mountain Bridge. Mike Mazuka sending that pretty photo in. Here's another view from down a little bit further into Ulster County in the Highland area. Pramod Latawala sending this photo in. Look at the great color here. And one more stop uh, taking us into what is really right on the Bear Mountain Bridge. And look at that color there from the photo from Augie Latore. And we'll give you one final view of some color out in the High Falls area of Ulster County. Thanks to Heather Ballard for that photo. So some great color to our south. Halloween knocking on our doorstep here this upcoming Monday. The weather looks to be dry, albeit some cloudiness around, but we're going to keep it dry through the evening period. Here's a look at what's happening. High pressure right over us now, dry weather. A disturbance to our south is gradually going to lift north, but weaken as it does so. So clouds will be spreading in starting tomorrow night, and then I think we'll have a fair amount of cloudiness on Monday. But very little in the way of moisture heading in our direction, so I'm thinking only some widely scattered showers starting Monday night and into Tuesday. So there'll be a few, but not a lot of rain. Here we are into tomorrow. It's going to be a mostly sunny day, nothing more than a few high clouds by late afternoon. Tomorrow night, we'll call it partly cloudy as we get a little more high and mid-level cloudiness to come on in. Here we are into the day Monday. More clouds than sun, but you can see it's staying dry into the early evening. So for the trick-or-treat, activities i think we're okay later at night though there will be a few showers developing especially as we move beyond midnight and then we'll carry that risk of showers onward into the day tuesday but again not a lot of coverage just some here and there so the forecast for your sunday 60 to 65 mostly sunny skies and the seven day forecast shows that halloween is going to stay dry for the most part later at night there could be a few showers some showers and spots Tuesday, and then it's dry and pleasant weather the rest of the week with temperatures staying in the 60s. So a pretty good outlook there overall for us, Tom. Yeah, thanks, Craig. Coming up, we're talking about one capital region program looking to impact students' futures with STEM. And Hollow Weekend is here. One event fusing together the spirit of Halloween and the healthy lifestyle of running. Coming up next. Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute working to get young students interested in the STEM field today. This was really cool. Ninth graders who were enrolled in the Rise High program at Clarkson assembled their very own models from designs they created. Programs like these really making a difference. 
So what we're trying to do here is um, we provide mentors in the classroom, we show them a pathway to a successful career in science and technology, and they'll choose to go to college and pursue that topic, that discipline, and be uh, a successful engineer or teacher or scientist um, when they graduate college. Belanger says the program targets students as young as sixth graders and strives to stay connected with them come time for college. The city of Albany had its first ever trick or trot 5K pumpkin run this Halloween season. The Halloween spirit was in full force during the race. Many people wearing costumes while they ran. Not easy. Some of the best costumes took home a downtown Albany gift card. A lot of people were excited. A lot of people got wear, wear costumes and you saw a lot of families here and they're excited to be here. So we think it's just going to keep growing every year. It's just another reason for them to safely go through the park at Washington Park at night, look at it in a different view and just to get together. You saw tons of families together just being healthy, running, but also walking. The best of both worlds. All right, now let's welcome AJ. He's got sports. Coming up in sports, we had a big day of college football, but the biggest local story comes out of the youth Pop Warner football. We'll have an update from their big games right after the break. And now, CBS 6 Sports, sponsored by your local upstate Chevy dealers. Hey, I'm AJ Pankowski. In sports, college football is pushing through their season as we are now getting to the back stretch of games. Youth football, on the other hand, already in their Super Bowls, and boy, did they put on a show. But before we get to that, let's see how our local college teams fared in their matchups. We start off up in Syracuse, the Orange back home following a heartbreaking loss to Clemson last week. This week, they took on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish, and the first play of the game is a Garrett Schrader pass that is intercepted by Brandon Joseph. He takes it all the way back for a pick six. 7-0 Irish within a blink of the eye, but the Cuse would respond. This time, Schrader finds his favorite target, Aronde Gadsden, for a touchdown. It's 7-7. Right before the half, 14-7 Notre Dame. The Irish would score on the play action. Jaden Thomas would come down with the touchdown catch. 21-7 at the break. Schrader left the game with a head injury. In the third, 24-10 now. Cuse trying to respond. Their workhorse, Sean Tucker, finds his way into the end zone. 24-17 now. But... The rest of the way was all Irish. This is a Roderick Estime rushing touchdown. Would get their lead back up to 31-17, and they'd go on to win 41-24. Syracuse has now lost two games in a row. Over to some D3 action. Union was on the road today at Hobart, and their game didn't end well either. They did come out firing, though. First quarter, look at this. Donovan Bacotti going deep down the field, and he has Nicholas Dunneman open for the touchdown. 53 yards, 7-3 Dutchman. But... The Statesman woke up after this. 10-7 Hobart here. And then right here on this Wildcat formation, Rayshon Boswell would turn on the burners and outrun everyone for the touchdown. Union's turn to respond, though. Picotti sending it through the air again. And what an amazing catch by Dunneman in the end zone for yet another touchdown. The lead's cut to three. Still in the second, Union would take the lead. Picotti again through the air would find an open Avery Turton who gets past the goal line for a touchdown. 21-17 Union. But to the fourth, Hobart would get the game-winning touchdown down right here. David Cruson sending it deep and he finds an open rain. Damarola who does the rest for the score. Wow, what a back and forth game. Hobart escapes with a 23-21 win over Union. RPI and U Albany were also in action. The Engineers took a trip out to the 12th ranked and undefeated Ithaca College. The Bombers took care of business and won a low scoring affair 13-10 over RPI. I know that'll make my man Tom happy. And U Albany took on Stony Brook at home and won this matchup with ease by a final score of 59-14. The Great Danes get their second win on the season. And finally, for our last story tonight, we have an update from the youth football stars out of Albany Pop Warner. If you remember Thursday night, we said all age levels will be in their respected Super Bowls, looking to move on to regionals. The 8U team was looking for their back-to-back -back championship win. The 10U team playing each other because they beat everybody else. And the 12U looking for the three-peat. Well, let's see how they did. We had the clean sweep. The 8U team beat Schenectady Belmont by a final score of 31-12. The 10U A team beat the 10U B team 32-6. And the 12U team beat Schenectady 15-8 in an overtime thriller. All three divisions will have Albany Pop Warner advancing to the regionals. Hats off to the kids and the volunteer coaches. We're going to be watching to see how far they can go. What a great story out of Albany. 
And that'll do it for your look into sports. Back to you. You know those Ithaca Bombers come to Union next week, Craig. That's exciting. I have a hint or at least a, an idea you might be down there. I might be, <laughs> for sure. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time, everyone.